I'm, I'm just going to call it out the dirty pool that's being played by some of the incumbents, some of the bigger ISPs. There, there was one story that I, I really like because I think it's one of the clearest examples of how incumbents can play with local politics to prevent the passage of municipal networks. There was a small city in the tri-state uh, area in Illinois. Now, they were ignored year after year. This, this was that city that for 20 years had been promised by both Comcast and the, the local telco that they would come in, they would install fiber. It never happened. They, they were limited to, to modem speeds. So they put onto the ballot a municipal fiber bond. They were gonna uh, they were gonna ha have it be a voluntary program. They weren't gonna put any tax money into it. It was gonna be pr purely voluntarily funded. But they were going to roll out fiber to the city and, and give high speed access to all the residents. Our early polling for putting up this bond measure was high. It was seventy seven percent two weeks before voting. So it was one of these. Yeah, this is gonna pass. Now right before the vote. Flyers started showing up at all the addresses for all the homes in the city from a committee that no one had ever heard about. And it was, let me spell out what this is going to uh, what this is going to mean. And it spouted facts like every municipality that has ever tried to roll out fiber has failed and cost the taxpayers millions. The flyers claimed that the broadband initiative would cost millions every year just to keep up the network. And it was using facts from the telecom telecommunications industry to show you exactly how expensive it was to run your own ISP. And along with the flyers, suddenly a bunch of, of paid newspaper stories started appearing that showed that the citizens of the Tri-County area firmly oppose this bill. As a result, in two weeks, it went from 77% favorable to 80% unfavorable, and the motion passed. The uh, motion failed. Now, they were never able to connect that, that advertising and those stories back to Comcast, but most people are assuming it was Comcast. How often do you hear stories like that? It's fairly frequent, frankly. Um, you know, there's... There's uh, those stories when it comes to public votes. Um, there was a, a push poll that was commissioned in uh, Lafayette by the Cox, um, well, the, the cable industry, which was led by Cox, um, in which they asked questions like, um, since the water restricts you to limiting, uh, restricts you to watering your lawn on certain days of the week, are you worried that you would not be able to watch television or use the internet on certain days of the week? Um, which is kind of a comical question, but they also asked questions designed um, to inflame racial tensions between um, uh, the areas of the city that um, were um, uh, more of the African-American concentration and lower income, which was really disconcerting. That might be the dirtiest, uh, ho most horrible thing I've seen just in terms of cynicism. Um, we've seen in, in Longmont, uh, Colorado, which now has one of the lowest price gigs in America uh, because the city did do it, but uh, Comcast spent over a half million dollars over two referendums to convince people to vote no. And it's an interesting dynamic where in the first referendum, people were swayed by the Comcast uh, propaganda. But then afterward, they started asking questions like, wait a minute, what, what, what really happened there? You know, why were we listening to Comcast's argument? And so two years later, they had the referendum again. And it was a landslide in favor because the community was prepared for it. So... It's not always the case that those dirty tactics are effective, um, but the industry will use every opportunity and every tool at its rather large disposal to try and stop competition. That's true of local governments getting involved. Uh, we see very similar tactics with private companies that try to come up and compete with Comcast or Charter. Um, price discrimination that the federal government and the state's attorneys general do not um, sort of crack down on and investigate because it's so hard to prove. Uh, so, I mean, there's is a real intimidation of elected officials. And we see that when a network does not fail, or I'm sorry, when a network does not succeed, um, you know, there's a few networks that I think we would agree have failed, um, that when that happens as a result of Comcast or Charter or another cable company putting a lot of pressure on them, it really scares all the other neighboring communities uh, away from doing something, which unfortunately encourages them to just double down on these dirty tactics. It's interesting that you say that uh, the second time that referendum went around, they were prepared for it. And I think maybe that's the reality we live in. If if we want if we want to pass these these legislative solutions to poor broadband, you actually have to think about preparing the community for what they're eventually going to get. Uh, I'm thinking of two questionnaire questions that people actually sent to me. They sent me clips from questionnaires that they received while their cities were were trying to pass 
municipal fiber uh, um, bills. The first one said, uh, experts have said that a lot of the in a lot of broadband on the internet promotes addiction to porn. Are you comfortable with your tax dollars being used to promote porn? And uh, the second one was uh, along the same lines. There is a growing number of hate groups on the internet. Do you support the use of your tax money to give these hate groups more publicity? And it's 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 just as simple as that. It's putting a little bit of a no into someone's head and, and getting them to associate something with the worst thing possible. If that's how this works, and we now need to consider informing the electorate, how do we do that? How, how does that become a campaign of, well, this is probably what you're going to hear in the next couple of weeks. Here's how you should respond to it. Well, I think that's uh, uh, that was what I think of as the vaccine approach, preparing them. Um, you know, you know, an answer that I that I sometimes give flippantly might be, you have no idea what's transported on your public roads. If you're concerned about that, um, our taxpayer dollars build roads, and trucks use them to move all kinds of manner of things, from illegal drugs to pornography to who knows what. And, and we don't stop investing in roads. Um, you know, telephones have been used to commit fraud. Um, so I think there's that. Um, um, you know, you can definitely try and do a vaccine, but one of the reasons that my organization really likes organizing around this is I think it's a real opportunity to try and, and help people to think about these things more deeply. We're in an age where I think um, a lot of people are influenced by what they see on TV. And I think in 50 or 100 years, people will be less susceptible to just believing things that happen to show up on television. And I think we have to help people to just think more broadly about who they trust more, their local government or uh, you know a, a, a big corporation that's headquartered in Philadelphia or, or Dallas. And you know, for some people, they might say, well, I really Really don't like my local government and it doesn't work very well. And my answer to that is generally, if you have a local government that does not work well, it probably shouldn't build a network. The first thing you should do is get its house in order, and then it may want to look at building a network.